Hello and welcome to this presentation on Diphylobotrium latum, or as more commonly referred to, the broadfish tapeworm. This, of course, is a tapeworm that can measure up to an amazing 12 metres long. Yet, it occurs most frequently around the circumpolar regions, but also in South America, possibly due to the induction of aquaponics. I will now discuss, throughout its morphology, its key features and characteristics. Characidium are basically formed once eggs, which will be discussed later on, are placed into a body of water. After being placed into this body of water, one to two weeks later, they will form what's called a ciliated embryo, which contains, of course, cilia. In the visual on the right, we also see another significant feature, three pairs of larval hooks. After its three-week journey in the cyclops, it has lost its cilia, thus it becomes a prosecoid. It has a spindle-like body and a caudal spherical appendage, or curcuma, which has the embryonic hook on it. At the top, on the right-hand diagram, you can also see the cephalic invagination. Moving through now to the fish's gut wall, its liver muscles. After one to three weeks, we will find forming in here the pleurisacoid. We'll notice it has a totally invaginated head in the diagram. It has a caudal appendage, wrinkles, it's unsegmented, and upon visual inspection, you'll notice that it's white and roughly flat. After five to six weeks, in your small intestine, you'll start to see a yellowish gray adult worm forming. You'll notice it's got a head, which is called a scolex. It's embedded in mucosa. Now, as we see from the name, dibothria means actually two grooves or butts on both ventricle and dorsal surfaces. You can see that in the diagram on the bottom right. Now, as we look further down towards the body, we see it's segmented. These are called proglotides. The uterus is located in the very middle. Being a hermaphrodite, it has genital pores for both the vas deferens, the vagina, and the uterus as it produces its eggs. The ovary is bilocked and the uterus is coiled. And of course, towards the bottom of the worm, we'll see these segments start to get a little shrunken. This is due to the egg discharge, which is released in our fecal matter. Over here, we've got one of the more fascinating eggs you'll see. I reckon the best structure on this is at the very top. It's called the operculum. If we also move down to the centre of the egg, you'll see, as have been discussed, there are immature caracidium. As we move to the bottom, you'll see a knob-like structure. Overall, these three things are very important in the identification of the egg and thus helps with the diagnosis, which will be discussed later on. You can also note as well, millions of these are produced every day and it's in its non-infective form. Let us now imagine all these hosts and their life cycle, utilizing all the information we just learned and linking it together. Beginning at the top, moving clockwise, us humans are the definitive host because we have the adult worm in our small intestines. Then, our eggs are released through our feces, they become in contact with water and they form charisidium, of course, the ciliated embryo. Then, they are ingested by the cyclops and it becomes the prosecoid larva, which makes the cyclops the intermediate host number one. Then those cyclopses are ingested by the fish and it makes the fish the intermediate host two as they form the pleurisacoid larva. And then we eat the fish that's undercooked and then we become the definitive host and the cycle continues. So you're at the doctor and you're at least feeling very tired and fatigued and you just, even in some small severe cases, you might even have a bit of diarrhea, you might have a bit of abdominal pain, so on and so on. And the doctor goes, you know what, I have a feeling this might be diphylobothriasis. So what they do is they check a sample of your stool and then look specifically for these eggs. These eggs are the ones that we have discussed before and their specific characteristics like operculum, so on, so on, so on. What this does to make you feel so tired is it reduces your B12 absorption due to it releasing so much unsaturated fatty acids. This can cause, you know, macrocytic anemia, which is basically, you know, bigger red blood cells. It can also cause eosinophilia, 
which is basically when you have more white blood cells in your blood, you know, per microliter count, so on and so on. It's treated by praziquantel, and if you don't want this to happen again, you just eat cooked fish. We see cases of this dating back ages and ages ago, but we can't quite find the fertility rate of it, but we know that it does cause death in severe, severe cases. Social interaction through globalisation really increased this influx of um, delatum, and you can prevent it by just eating cooked fish, really. Here's my bibliography, and uh, thanks for listening.